AI and voice is gonna be game changing. The way that our grandparents look at an iPhone, a lot of you are gonna look at AI voice that way. It's gonna change your life. You got your perspective. I just wanna be happy. Don't you wanna be happy? So Gary, thank you again. Um, like we said, my name is Drew. I'm on the marketing team here at Vivo. There's also Lillian at the top as well as Betty, our CMO. Um, I'm really excited to both ask you a lot of some pre-submitted questions that people have been submitting over the last uh, several weeks. And we'll also pull up a couple people to ask you some stuff on their own. So, so let's, yeah, let's get into it. Um, I think there's a good opportunity to sort of kick off this, this hour with asking you sort of a, a wide ranging question, right? There's been a lot of change over the last year where uh, we've historically been FIVO in the live entertainment and sports mm. space. Yep. And I think there's a good, uh, a good way to kick it off is what are some of the consumer engagement trends that you've seen, whether they've changed or how, they're, how this past year has, has set up for the future? I mean, the, the impact of COVID on consumer behavior is extraordinary. Like, I promise you that every single person here is grossly underestimating the impact of it. And it's not as simple as like, we're not in the office or live event. Like by show of hands, and I'll try to go fast on the 22 screens here. By show of hands, how many people here have bought something on the internet as a consumer good, like a toothpaste, a deodorant, shampoo, food that they had never bought before pre-COVID because they were buying, hold up your, I mean, do you understand how big of a deal that is? Every hand going up? It also means that you might be ordering from Seamless or Postmates or Uber Eats from a restaurant locally that you tried that now becomes your main restaurant, not the one. I mean, this is a big deal. Like I'm no longer gonna fly to Madrid and give a keynote and then leave right away. I'm gonna actually enjoy Madrid for two days because I'm gonna work from Zoom back in New York during the day, but like not, ha like it, this is big, big, right? And, and I think anybody who doesn't realize that is because they're worried that it's gonna hurt their business and they just want it to go back to 2019, but they're not paying attention to the human being. This is gonna affect companies. I mean, there's some big, Google, there's some big companies, Google down, that have over 50% of their, their employees telling them they don't wanna ever come back to the office ever. And then there's a bunch of people in here that wanna punch their kids in the mouth and can't wait to get back to the office. Like, you know how it is, I get it. But, but just because you might go back to normal in your mind, even though you've already made plenty of new decisions that you don't even realize, let there be no confusion. On the flip side, every live event in 2022 is gonna act exactly like it did in 2019, all of them. Like we're not gonna not, like it's just, we're humans. We're gonna congregate. You know, um, could some people decide they don't wanna go? Sure, I would argue there's a lot of people that realize how much they love sporting events and concerts during this time and may double up in 2022 and 2023. So those are some of the themes that are running through my head. It's funny, actually, I was talking to Ari about this exact thing last week and he, he said the exact same thing. There's gonna be a lot of pent up demand for not being able to do these things over the last year and a half, year, whatever. Oh my God. Everybody who used to complain about sitting in traffic for an hour when they went to the Washington football team game, you know, is now, that's right, Chanel, that was for you, is now, um, is now gonna be thrilled to sit in that traffic after two years. You, you we, you know, so I, I think there's gonna be some really extra consumer habits, consumption habits. I've watched more fucking TV in the last 12 months than I've watched in the last 12 years. You know, um, I've added HBO Max and Hulu and like, you know, that's good. You know, so there's just so many things. I think I play chess now because of Queen's Gambit, something I wouldn't even watched had there not been COVID. That like, just think about that shit. Yeah, it's, it's very interesting. So in thinking of the way our days and our routines have changed, what has changed in your own daily routine that you've either picked up and you want to continue or you've found yourself falling off from? You know, I love people, which is why I think social media, when you don't just use it as a blasting, so real for me. I've been shocked by like, 
even notice what I did with Chanel just now, and I'm clicking around, right? I see, like uh, I'm looking at Sarah Houston right now. I'm looking at J Jake Van S. You know, I'm looking at Randy S. Like I'm looking, right? Because I need human interaction. I've been blown away. Paul B's in the building. I've been blown away by how much I can feel y'all in this format. It's not a hundred, but it's fucking 96. And in that 96, it's gonna change a lot of things for me, right? I'm gonna be much more efficient with meetings. You know, I play in VIP life. I'm trying to get to dinner with a CEO to make things happen. Sometimes that takes me and her nine months to lock in. That's easy now on Zoom over a glass of wine. I mean, my business development has changed forever. I'm gonna be far more efficient using the internet, go figure, to, to win that game because now everyone's used to Zoom life. And I think this mixed world of Zoom life and real life is very real now. And I think that, um, I think that's gonna be the biggest change, how I manage my time because I'm gonna be able to use virtual as a weapon to be more efficient. No more waking up at 4.30 in the morning for one meeting in Chicago on a 6 a.m. flight for a 12.30 in Chicago and flying back at 6 to, that's fucking stupid. And that's gonna be pretty cool, which will lead to incredible impact. More time with my kids. I'm gonna catch more basketball games at 4.30 because I'm in the city and not in Chicago. Um, just more efficiency. I'm, I'm ecstatic. There's something too in that, that we've talked about a lot with some of our collegiate partners and the idea of how alumni networks now, you know, there might've been a, I went to Maryland, right? So there was a New York City alumni event or an LA alumni event. Now your reach as a college marketer is instantly across the country and it pulls in a lot more people, which is, which is a good example of that, I think. Everything wins when you eliminate friction. You know yeah. why you love Amazon? Because it eliminates friction. Convenience is king. This was established a long time ago. What, what, what this culture of virtual is gonna do is gonna eliminate friction. There are a lot of things that you used to not go to because you just couldn't make it. That you're just gonna go into the Zoom part. There are gonna be many events that are gonna be half Zoom, half real. A 400% four, a networking event right now, I genuinely believe will be 137 people in a room and a screen with what we're all looking at right now and we're doing our thing here and then, you know, it's, it's mixed. I hate when people, everyone's like, it's gonna be this or it's gonna be this. There's no, there's no extreme, it's gonna be the middle. It's gonna be mixed. And I think it has a chance to make real life events far more interesting and uh, I'm excited about it. So let's dive into that a little bit. So real life events, again, looking at the sports through a sports lens, how, is that hybrid virtual and real life experience going to change in the future? I, I own coaches club seats for the New York Jets and pay a fortune for it. And I would pay an extra thousand dollars per game to be in the locker room virtually for a Jets game. Now, it can get pretty gangster in those locker rooms after the game. So I don't know if that's gonna be the thing the Jets decide to sell, but, but if I'm an artist, if I ever, if I had the luxury of being Drake, right? And I'm a businessman, I'm selling $1,500 a head virtual passes for a cam in my green room during my tour, for the whole tour. Now, if I'm doing crazy shit or fuck the money, I need my relaxation, I'm not. But for Gary Vee, knowing my personality, because I'm not doing dumb shit, I'm not trying to do that bad shit, and I'm addicted to fucking human interaction, I'm fucking doing that all day long, right? So it, you know, it's, it's really gonna be an interesting thing. It's completely opened up things. And what I'm excited about is some of the people that are getting hurt the most, artists, venues, teams, I think they're gonna win the most in 2025 because they're gonna innovate on top. They've just found a ton of revenue that the limitations of people physically being there has opened up. I think it's gonna be unbelievable. I think it's gonna be the one great once, I love the concept of one step back, two steps forward. I think this is gonna be a huge two steps forward for the most innovated venues, organizations, leagues. There's a huge opportunity for access. We will pay for access that virtual give us that we can't get otherwise. Do you think this is finally the stage where we've heard about VR for a long time? Do you think this is where that access and, and that virtual hybrid comes into play from a VR perspective? I do not. 
as of the short term. Nobody on this call knows a real human being who normally goes on VR for an hour a day. There's no normal human in America that goes into VR an hour a day. They're in the business, they're in B2B, they're a very edge technologist that's curious, but to talk real life, you have to wait to scale happens. And until I see humans spending an hour a day in entertainment or education in VR, I can't bet on VR. So talking about one step backwards, two steps forwards, in the sports industry, what is the most immediate uh, step that needs to be taken to take a big step forward? To immediately right now strategize for 2022, what your virtual monetization or branding strategy is. And have you seen a certain league or sport or team already sort of grabbing that by the horns? I have not, but I'm also not really looking. So it doesn't mean it's not happening, but I'll give you, I'll give you a good one. If you're a, a, a Brooklyn Nets fan and in their dressing room or right next to it, they decided to create a green room confectional before the game. And like two guys per game are guaranteed to go in there and do Q and A like this for eight minutes prior to a game. And you get a season pass of that for an extra uptick at $69 or $150, a ton of people are gonna buy that. Yeah. That's a strategy that if I owned the Jets right now, I'd be implementing, right? The 9 a.m. to 10 a.m., because I know the football schedule, confessional in the locker room, we guarantee you two, you might get more. We're the New York Jets, it's a $99 pass. It's good branding, we can film the content, we can distribute the content social, and if we can get 10,000 fans, it could start meaning to be a little nut, could be a little nut. Totally. So I think uh, it's time to pull up our first uh, panelist to ask a question. Eric from the University of South Carolina, AD. Uh, I'm going to ask you to unmute now and uh, ask your question. All right, I appreciate it, Gary. Uh, hope you guys can hear me okay. You've, can, Eric. you've talked about uh, empathy as a superpower before in marketing, but uh, I've struggled to see how you can deliver empathy at scale when we have 15,000 accounts, families that we're trying to uh, develop relationships with. How, how would you go about delivering empathy at scale? By hiring a ton more people and spending a lot less money on the media distribution of the content we make. Fair enough. Yeah, I mean, when I buy the New York Jets, Eric, I swear to God, I plan on having a one-on-one -on -one relationship with every season ticket holder. Not me, but I'll be in the mix because I'm a character, but the organization. And how am I going to do that? Instead of having a 17 person sales team, I'm going to have, I'll probably have that, but, I'm, but instead of spending uh, money on billboards and commercials to get people to buy season tickets in August on network television, I'm going to take those dollars and I'm going to put it into you know, lifetime value, what I call farmers. And I'm going to say, let's say you were on my team and say, Eric, here is your 83 season ticket holders. No, like they're your friends. And do, do, do. I, I do this all the time. I'm building in the greatest year of scalability, right? In a world where I'm an early investor in Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, I've spent the last 10 years building a company that has 1,000 employees. I believe in this scaling the unscalable through human beings. So I think you can do it, but, I, but, but it's a great question. And of course, technology with AI and ML and, and you know, app structures, you could do a lot of scaling um, to, make the, to make you effective and efficient, but the human spirit is something you can't automate or fake. And so I need to put you in a position to be able to handle 83 efficiently with all the tools I put you around you and hopefully continue to advance that so you can go to 96 because maybe with AI, every time somebody emails you or texts you with this exact question, which is just information, it can automatically reply next Friday at four. You know, like that will come along. And so as AI and machine learning advances, all of a sudden the Eric can handle 813 instead of 83. And then you got something really brilliant. No, I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Next, we're gonna go to uh, Gab from the Flyers. Uh, Gab, I'm going to ask you to unmute now too and ask your question. Hi, Gary. Uh, my question is managing a team remotely 
What are some tips and tricks to keep the staff engaged, um, feeling valued, motivated in this time when the unforeseen future of uh, live events coming back? Um, it's really wild. It's a great segue from Eric's question. It's almost like the same deep thesis, right? Like for example, yesterday, I just surprise jumped into like five different meetings and just Santa Claus to people. Right? They think they're having a regular meeting. I come in, I'm like, hey, and I'm sending you all a bottle of champagne. See ya. That's like a good thing for a CEO to do or a leader, right? Uh, just being there for people. Like, how big is your team? 10. That's a dream for me, right? Like, to me, that's just you over the next three weeks, individually to those 10, writing a very long email or a Slack or a text, long. Like, hey, Karen, let's think back to when you first started that first day when I spilled all the coffee on you, or did, right? And then it really ends with, how are you and do you need anything from me? Thank you. The answer is giving a shit. Mm -hmm. Awesome, next we're gonna go to Cooper from the PGA. Gary B, good to be talking to you, my man. Real pleasure, Coop. Uh, my question is, what is the first thing that you do every day and how do you parlay that into success? And it doesn't necessarily have to be a task, but how do you kind of build on what the, you know, how you start your day and, and make that into a successful day? It's really funny because I actually have a real answer, not like a cliche bullshit answer, but it's a very weird answer. I am basically an operating system. What I would call like the way I take oxygen, I'm going to, my answer is going to be this way. I'm not joking. This is not like I'm fluffy or Eric said I'm empathy and Ari said I'm a good guy. Like this is real talk now. I am so fucking pumped when I wake up in the morning and nobody called me in the middle of the night to say something atrocious happened that I'm like almost shook by gratitude that all the dog shit of my business day almost feels secondary, right? Like, like honestly, I literally go into immediate gratitude. And then I grab my phone and look at my text and most of it's like this problem in Singapore, this problem in London, this thing, you know, this Jets player is not playing this week, all bad news, you know, like, so like, but because I had that quick, like, I don't think it's as like, or it's not as like direct as meditation coop, right? It's not as direct as that, but I would say 365 days, I would say 16 to 39 days a year. It's like directly thoughtful. Like I'm like, huh, all right right? But it's my constant operating system. It's how I live my life. Gotcha. Um, and then, and, and, and just, you know, coping with the bad stuff, do you, do you just kind of put yourself into a mental state where you can handle that and continue to operate while, you know, thinking about the good things and using your successes to kind of trump all that? When I'm most struck right now, I have a crazy situation where there's a $10 million delta between a four year client at VaynerMedia where I was anticipating something and they're coming in at that level and it's devastating, it's bad for us. We're a small company, 200 million is great, but like, and we did it fast, but it's, it's meaningful. Literally, this happened today. Literally, I go into, what if they gave me 40 million, but I got a text that my mom's in the emergency room. I always, always put life's perspective as an overlay over business issues. Gotcha, love it. Thanks for the answer. Gotcha, brother. So we also have a question from Carl, who's at the Red Sox, who is does not want to be on camera because he's on baby duty today, but I'm gonna ask it for him. Um, what is your recommendation for finding a way to get, whether it's your, your brand's messaging or your brand's voice to stand out in the clutter, especially when everyone is now trying to vie for the same eyeballs? Um, by, by being better. And I know this is a really important question, my friends, since, especially since there's a lot of sports talk going on. A lot of you are private messaging me, so I'm giving you guys my information in here. Um, actually, let's use, uh, let's use uh, Colin, who just hit me up. Like, if you wanna be a New York Islanders player, you need to be a better hockey player than the rest of the world. I love when people are like, Gary Vee, everything you talk about is, now it's hard, everyone's doing it. I'm like, uh-huh. And, you know, the, let me say this to everybody when it comes to marketing. Your ability to make pictures, videos, animated GIFs, audio, written word, and then understanding the context 
of LinkedIn, Facebook, Pinterest, YouTube, Instagram, Spotify, to make that content work in the context of the platform from a utility standpoint, but also having the intuition and understanding of the consumer's psychology while they're on it, right? Betty Tran is not the same human when she's in her Pinterest feed than when she's in her LinkedIn feed. She's the slightly different version of herself mindset wise. The picture and video you put in there is imperative. The, um, the lack of massively good LinkedIn strategy, creative and media amplification that's being done in this room when it is the answer to almost everyone's questions in this room is staggering to me. The reason, Eric, I'm gonna be able to afford 85 people doing that imaginary job is because I'm not gonna need 17 salespeople. I'm gonna need four because I'm so good at marketing as a lead gen that I'm gonna be able to be more efficient with my dollars. So, so that's the answer. I know it's noisy. Everything is. Life. It's called competition. I love when people are in competition arenas, like in the sports business, and like, like perplexed by competition. Yes, everybody wants to get that local 50 store chain in Washington to be the sponsor. I get that. And so you must be better than everybody because it's not just you, it's not just, right, Chanel versus the Capitals or the Nationals or the Orioles or the Ravens. It's also that money could go to Facebook. That money can go to LinkedIn. That money can go to direct mail. That money can go to the Baltimore Sun. That like, and by the way, that's what I fucking love about this game. I love competing. So we've, uh, we were looking at a lot of the questions that were coming in and a lot of people were talking about when you're creating your own brand or wanting to enhance your own brand voice, should you concentrate on scale or should you concentrate on exclusivity of that brand? What do you have to say to that? Both work. Coca-Cola is a good business. Country clubs that charge $500,000 a year are good businesses. I think the answer to that question is self-awareness. Is your product worth the exclusivity? And then do you know how to operate that business? Otherwise scale is gonna be what you wanna to aspire to. And how to play off that, that idea of FOMO as well is something we talk about a lot. Um, it's, it's a good driver for, R and I have, have said before, but latent demand. There's, a, there's an interesting angle to. Especially when you don't lose trust with the community and the consumer, because a lot of you create bullshit exclusivity and, and demand. And then when you're stuck and you still got too much inventory and you have to get rid of it, you undermine that execution, thus becoming vulnerable. Crying wolf in this industry is the biggest vulnerability. Do you have an example of how that has led a brand astray? Everybody who says limited or this, that, and then have to discount when it wasn't limited loses. The end. A question so we to got me, to me, it's about then the strategy of creating limitation that has demand so that you're not forced into faking the funk. Because once you lose that trust with the end consumer that they're just gonna wait you out or buy it somewhere else or secondary this, you're fucking vulnerable. Yeah, for sure. There's a, there's a question that several actual college students um, submitted talking about- Hold on, I apologize. Oh, sorry. Carl M, for you to put the trash talk logo in your back screen, that's marketing. You hacked my attention. I'm impressed, brother. Let me know if you need a job. All right, keep going. A question from a couple college students. Um, obviously, it's a weird time to enter the job market. Uh, it's a weird time to be feeling ambitious and have some, some a lot of doubt and uncertainty around the, the start to your career. What do you have to say uh, as far as advice for some of the people entering the, the job market right now? You don't get to choose what era you come out of college, right? You know, there's people on here that are like, fuck these kids. I came out in 2008 and nine during the great recession, there were no jobs. That's number one. Number two, you're either winning or losing in your perspective on life. The amount of people that are looking to hire people to do TikTok, TikTok creative in 2021 is remarkable. 
And who do you think they think knows how to do that? All the young people in the world, even though they may not. So I would argue that this is one of the greatest years ever to go from college into the workforce because we have an explosion of companies hiring content creators for digital and social, and they assume the best ones are the kids out of school. I think that people are gonna find a humongous, humongous market if they are thoughtful about what they wanna get into and are not rigid and saying, well, I have to get a job in this. If you have some humility and patience and you take the jobs that are there in front of you, I think there's a huge opportunity. Another question on this sort of job market career sort of angle is uh, a lot of people are asking, what's been your most effective way to find motivation in, in time of either uh, feeling stagnant or maybe feeling uninspired or stuck? Um, um, uh, practicality, being practical about the situation and suffocating entitlement. I think everybody here needs to realize that for all of us, we had the great fortune of being alive and living in America during the prime of its empireship. And if you look at the history of man over the last hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, the reason those kind of situations tend to lose their way is because people get entitled. People are like crying about things that people would literally love to have just a hundred years ago. I mean, there's been harder times than COVID. We are soft because we're an empire. And I think when you understand that and take a step back, you can get a lot more grateful and realize this will evolve. And the perspective one deploys against time like this really matters. Instead of being upset for what you don't have, let's be happy for what you have. A lot of people died during this pandemic. If you or someone you love didn't, that's already a huge win. Next, a lot of you have rekindled your relationships with your children or your plus ones. Others have learned that their plus ones might not be for them in the long term. And the fact that you weren't around each other all the time is why it was sustainable. And as much as that may hurt and me sound silly. It's a real gift to realize that and then hopefully both those individuals can go and become happy. There's a lot of great things that have happened here. I also wanna remind everybody that had COVID started two months earlier, Kobe Bryant would probably be alive for 50 more years. There was a lot of people destined to die in a traffic accident over the last year that lives were saved because they were stuck in their home. To me, this is glass half full versus glass half empty and that's how I approach these kind of conversations. It's a really, really good way to look at it. And it's, it's interesting to think about it like that. There's, there's also a changing gears slightly, but I wanted to talk a little bit about, we, we, we hit on it slightly earlier, but um, your idea of Santa Clausing a couple meetings. Um, I love it. I think it's an awesome idea. We got a lot of questions about what separates good leaders who get the job done from a great one. Intent. You know, like, what are you about? You know, I'm trying to get every person that I have ever spent any kind of time with to come to my funeral. That is my number one KPI. That is my number one KPI in my life. My number two KPI is enjoying the process of trying to buy the New York Jets professionally. That's a framework that allows me to be a great leader, right? You know, like, it, I, I don't, I don't care about anything other than legacy, which allows me to make human decisions instead of financial decisions every time I'm passed with them. I also had the great luxury of being raised by a parent, my mom, and my parents were together, my dad just worked all the time, who instilled disproportionate self-esteem in me, but also suffocated entitlement, right? So I have confidence, but I don't think I deserve anything. And if I disappear tomorrow, I don't think I meant anything regardless of the accolades. I mean it. I'll have 12 hours of good RIP Gary B comments and social and a story here or two. And what, right? Like, you know, like I think when you have humility, 
but you layer it with ambition and kindness, you can create a real great formula. And I think how real what just came out of my mouth is, is the delta between good and great. And I think I can end up being great because I really am not joking to you. And I think a lot of people say what I just said and don't actually act on it. I don't think people are trickable on the record. I know people might find that stunning. I don't think it's a sustainable game. And uh, so I live by that. When you talk about, when we talk about sort of humility and, and being human in, in career and the workforce, there's a lot of people that get either disillusioned or uh, worried or apprehensive about needing to hit numbers and coming off as disingenuine or needing to create something out of what a persona that might not be themselves, right? So a lot of questions that we saw were as sales reps, let's look at that specifically as the lens, how do you continue to be authentic and genuine, but also need to drive revenue for your company? By quitting if you don't believe in what you're selling. Uh, you can't imagine how much I love selling because I sell shit I believe in. Whether that was some weird Pinot Noir from Oregon when I was in the wine business, uh, whether that was the K-Swiss, K-Swiss sneakers I created, whether that's wine text, whether that's VaynerMedia. I, I, think it's, I think it's really hard for people in this room, if you don't believe in your product and the thing that you're offering, you're in a shitty spot, right? Because now, because you inherently are not authentic. The game's over before you started. If you think you're selling somebody an obstructed view <laughs> seat because you got to move the inventory, or if you are trying to sell a suite and you know they're grossly overpriced because it's year 13 in your venue and the fixtures aren't as nice as they used to be, the liquor's a little diluted down. No more Grey Goose, it's now smearing off. You know what I mean? You gotta believe in what you fucking sell. And, and by the way, I'm not, I'm not interested in sitting in my high horse. If you're actually sitting here and saying, I actually don't, but fuck Gary, like I can't quit my job. You don't have to do it right now, but you need to recognize it's true. And you should start the process of figuring that out. Otherwise, you're gonna be a cliche salesperson and they're gonna feel it. I think we're gonna bring up the next person now and, and uh, Chanel from the Washington football team. I wanted to ask you to unmute and ask your question. Sure. Yeah, so Gary, you have a very strong message um, as it relates to authenticity. So, you know, what advice would you give us on how to build authentic client relationships uh, without coming off as phony? You know, I like to tell people the truth, right? So if you came to me and I was the DC wine business, right? And you're like, look, I'm trying to get your business. I'm like, I respect that. I'm like, let's talk about it. You know, like, hey, I'm about the skins and I wanna be on the field and you're gonna trick me with that. And that's gonna be the real hook why I buy that bullshit $80,000 sponsorship. But like, can you make it worth for my business a little bit better? You know, like just real, it works. And by the way, you're talking to somebody at 13 who was more full of shit than anybody I've ever met. My, I had a lot of gift of gab. I was a raw street kid that came from nothing and I was just trying to win. But I, so I, so I know what it looks like. And, it, and honesty and candor and ambition and kindness and listening, listening's a beast. You know, I'm so confusing to people because I talk so much. I have a certain way of talking. I'm sure there's people here I've cursed a little bit that don't like, I respect that. I come from where I come from, I am who I am. Every minute I'm not doing this, I'm listening. And in that listening, it's, it's really made me powerful. And I think listening, right? If you see a big business in your region going on TikTok and going ham, you're listening, right? Got it? So when you call and be like, Carl, you're killing it on TikTok. Do you wanna be our first sponsor on our pregame TikTok campaign? You see where I'm going? You're innovating, you're watching, you're listening, you're watching, you're listening. Don't come with the same playbook to everybody. Contextualize that shit. Next, we are going to- By the way, Carl said radical candor. And Carl, I look at it as kind candor. I've got a little bit of a slightly different tweak because candor can be tough because people are insecure and they get nervous. 
I've been throwing around something called kind candor, which is if you're gonna shoot it straight, come with compassion and empathy and, 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 and nice intent. It's a really important part of being a leader. If you gotta tell, you know, if Alicia Lynch has to tell somebody that they're not performing, if you can come with kindness around that candor, you have a much better shot because when you just go with candor, most people will take it and drive with insecurity and get fear-based and it throws off the whole system. You can't do matter of fact candor because 90% of people are gonna start looking for a job an hour later because they think you're gonna fire them in a month. Even though you thought about it as a good thing, you gotta come with kind candor. Hey, Carl, you've just been here six months. You know what I mean? I get it. You know, maybe you're struggling with COVID. You know, I'm here for you. How do I make it better because I'm seeing this shortcoming? By the way, on the record, the greatest vulnerability of my entire 25 year career, candor. I'm incredibly candorous on stage like right now and for my community, but as a manager, because my father was a mean candor deliverer, I demonized candor as a child. I didn't realize it. Probably the last two, three years recognition for me. And so I'm on my journey and I see the, I see the benefits and it was a real vulnerability. Candor, candor is a vulnerability because then you're bullshit and bullshit's bad. But I, I, I just also recognize most people struggled with candor. So this kind candor really matters. Ben Conrad from the Bucks, I'm gonna ask you to unmute. Hey Gary, hey, uh, taking the question. Um, my question is, I know you're super bullish on search through AI and voice for, for brands like that are live event, you know, sports, where do you see and how do you see us having to prepare for that, knowing that right now it's not top of mind, but it will be soon? And then I also was curious what the, uh, if you had to pick a, a third, under $30 red today, what would you buy? I would buy Portuguese reds. Portuguese reds are by far the most underpriced quality red wines in the world. The Douro, D-O-U-R-O, or the Dwao, D-O-A, are two incredible regions, but they're so bad at marketing that nobody really knows them. They, Portugal's known for port, but their red wines at 25 bucks rival $70 wines from France and the US. So that's that answer. Got a little nerdy on you. Um, <laughs> I believe in a decade from this moment, I will be sitting in my house and say, hey Alexa, what's the best deal on tickets for the Knicks game tonight? And everybody here needs to prepare for that. Hey Alexa, what's the best concert lineup coming up this month? Hey Alexa, you know, when COVID's over, can you remind me to go to two baseball games and find me a good deal? This is all gonna happen. I think it's a decade, so that's some time, but humans will always pick lack of friction. And people are confused, because right now everyone's like, hey Alexa, you know, you know, uh, play Billy Joel, right? It's early, but to remind everybody, the number one iPhone app in the first year of the iPhone was the drinking the beer app where it looked like, you, because it was early and we weren't innovating yet. Alexa and Google Home and Apple and whoever else gets into it are gonna be major, major, major players. It's going to happen. It's lack of friction, it's faster. It's faster for me to say, Alexa, send me a pizza than it is for me to open my Seamless app right now and buy pizza. Not to mention that Alexa is gonna know, or Google Home especially has a huge thing because it will know a lot of my information I mean, Google, set up a meeting with Ari as soon as possible. And Ari is also on Google Home and Google infrastructure, Google calendars. And it literally looks at our two calendars and sets up a meeting for us in our both open spots. AI and voice is gonna be game changing. The way that our grandparents look at an iPhone, a lot of you are gonna look at AI voice that way. It's gonna change your life. And you're gonna have to be prepared for that. You know, when, for the OGs in here, when Google came along and customers got smarter and new information, that fucked your game up. Imagine now getting the perfect answer from AI. Not, I'm gonna spend 40 minutes to find the best seat deal, the mathematical equation to the best seat deal. That's a very different game in one second because I wouldn't spend the time looking for it. I value my time too much but if I'm going to Milwaukee on business and the Bucks are a really fun team to watch right now and I'm like, hey Alexa, get me the best deal on courtside for 
for the Bucks game, when I go there on my calendar, right? It's gonna be efficient. Awesome, thank you. Which goes back to my bigger point, which is the challenge is gonna be for us is to make quality products, not be good at selling mediocre products. Something else that we wanted to bring up too, a lot of people were asking about as far as not so much the tech in the future, but the trends. A lot of people asked about uh, sports memorabilia, sports cards. I know you've been talking a lot about it recently. What is your sort of overall thought on the trend of that industry and where has it gone in the last year compared to where it might go in the next two or three? I mean, sports cards are very hot because I think they're contemporary art for the 35 to 45 year old contemporary modern high net worth individual. Like I'm not buying a fucking Jackson Pollock, you know, but I want a Bill Russell perfect grade, you know? And so you're gonna see that play out. There's also a gambling element now, right? You can buy a pack of cards and pull a $500,000 Zion. That's crazy. Full pledge gambling. Um, so I think that market has a really good run. You have real serious people coming into it now. I think you're gonna see a big, long wave of prosperity in that market. And it will ebb and flow. Certain People are gonna lose a ton of money on it because they're gonna bet the farm on Kendrick Nunn or, or, or Tyler Hero or Zion or John Morant. And unfortunately, some of those players won't become the best players ever. And that will have liabilities to the way people invested in them. But in, as an overall market, I think it's got a lot of potential. And I think, you know, I think for a lot of people that are trying to create experiences at that macro level, I think cards are incredible. And we know this, everybody here knows this, like giveaways at the stadium are really smart. Bobbleheads were a huge driver for a while. I think if people had a very smart sports card strategy and were able to navigate around the Panini and Tops rules, meaning properly and figuring out what they can do, I think they could be incredible um, arbitrage mechanisms. Back to what I said earlier, being smart, right? If all the upper bowl tickets came with a limited edition pack of cards that was exclusive to your stadium that season, you would sell out because people are gonna arb the eBay sell through against literally come to the games just for the content of the card. So. I think there's a lot of smart innovation that I would think about in that arena. What do you think about, cause it also plays into two things, right? The marketability of athletes and how each league is handling that. And also the rise of, you know, the Robin, it's been the Robin hood year. Everybody wants yep. to invest. Everybody wants alternative in, alternate investments. We just got a question from Sam who's asking, interesting on how the sports card and sports memorabilia is sort of a good indicator of the marketability of leagues athletes and how they're doing. So you look at the difference between the NBA and the MLB, there's, uh, you know, the trout could card it, did yeah, well. You could, yes. But the trout card, um, if you look at the long tail outside of trout, I mean, there are, you couldn't pick two leagues that are further apart right now in understanding consumers than MLB and NBA. Yeah. It's, you know, a, it's an interesting way to look at the trends of both, isn't it? The sports oh, cards. It's very clear. Like this is a modern American society is an NBA, proper football, soccer, UFC, esports culture where the NFL has to be very thoughtful, where Major League Baseball is in a really shitty spot. Um, if you're playing out 15, 20 years. I mean, the MLB decided to make a lot of money with BAM in the short term digitally and create a dictatorship that doesn't allow children to see content. Mike Trout can walk down Madison Avenue around naked and nobody will know who the fuck he is. You know, that's insane to me, right? And especially baseball. We, America is exploding in our Latino influence and we are sitting with Juan Soto Vladimir Guerrero Jr., Fernando Tatis, Javier Baez. I mean, this is insanity. And they're doing nothing about it. It's atrocious. It's the biggest reason my brother and I have gone into the baseball business. We expanded Vayner Sports into baseball because it need, these kids have to make more money off the field. It's crazy. 
Goes back to scale versus exclusivity, doesn't yes, it? Yes, thank you, Matt. I didn't even pick the best player of them all, Acuna Jr. I mean, it's fucking insane. Lindor, I mean, you know. Yes. It's, it's, it's very interesting. So literally the fact that the third star on the Bucks is more famous than Aaron Judge is ridiculous and true. Baseball has lost their way. And has nothing to do with, you know, and you know what the disguise of baseball is, is it's a summertime sport. It's a nice night out, right? You go to the ballpark. The problem is soccer is gonna take that business. I'll bet the house 25 years from now, that summertime sport activity, soccer's got a huge land grab against that guy and gal and kid that go to watch something. And, and by the way, don't let the NBA or the NFL decide to change the time of year they play. One of the, back to like people, remember the early question? Oh, that was a different, that was the first question here about how COVID changed consumer behavior? Yes, good, okay. Here's one. The NBA season shifted because of COVID. We're which, having an NFL game on a Wednesday. Well, there's that, but that's not sustainable. What is sustainable is three or four of the most influential NBA owners saying, huh. And, and this may or may, I have no clue, but like, they might be like, huh, this is better. They might. And then that's a big ass problem for baseball. It was even a good example of looking at uh, Paul Rabble and the the PLL, a tour league model. Right, because wrestling and the ice capades and the circus is a good business and people have forgotten about it and Paul did a great job and you're gonna see many more do it. I think we already saw the NWSL tried it this year too. It was, uh, it's, it's- Right, very- and then Connor's bringing it, we're not even talking about MMA mm-hmm. and like celebrity boxing's in a different place in our culture, right? What, you think, you think people that want to make money are going to just look the other way to the Nate Robinson, Jake Paul situation? You can see every fucking person you know on the internet fight. I'm probably going to have to fight next year. You know? So. We just got a, a very interesting question on this too uh, uh, from Michael. Uh, there's a digital token aspect in esports, right? Fortnite's huge on it. Is there that equivalent? Has any league or team or sport? By the way, real quick, I apologize. Um, JB asked me who I want to fight. I just want to give the official answer. I want to fight Tom Brady, just on the record, if we ever can get that fight made. So just want to give that answer. So <laughs> go ahead. You were saying digital tokens? Yeah, Sorry, block, yeah digital blockchain. Token. Yeah, blockchain, uh, mm-hmm. virtual currency. The whole world is based on IP. The play, do you understand how close the NBA is to going out of business? I'm so excited to drop this on everybody. Do you know how close the NBA is to going out of business? Let me play it out for you. Because this is a brain fuck compared to the last seven minutes of us talking. Yeah. The NBA is so star oriented that if LeBron and Greek Freak, Steph, Durant, and let's just pick 15 of the next, Luca, Donovan Mitchell, Zion, got together in a secret cave, 30 deep, texted 30 billionaires that are not owners of the NBA. Bezos, Schmezos, Sarah Blakely, you know, well, I guess Blakely's husband's involved with the Hawks, but nonetheless, do you understand that if the 30 best NBA players went to dinner right now, texted 30 billionaires that are not in the league and said, would you wanna be my 50-50 JV partner I own 50% of the team, you put up all the money and you own 50% of the team that I believe the NBA would fold. Interesting debate, yep, fun there. pot fodder. But the reason I bring that up is the fact that nobody here said that's completely outlandish, like that's stupid, because you would have said that if I said it 35 years ago. The fact that nobody said it's stupid, that you may not agree, and I'm, honestly, I'm not saying it will, I'm just saying it's fascinating to me because I believe it, right? Everyone's like, oh, the NBA is so brilliant. They're doing such a good job in marketing their players. They're so brilliant, they're so brilliant. I'm like, mm. 
You think the NCAA made these new rules of kids being able to make money or go to the league in 2023 because they wanted to? Get the fuck out of here. The internet collapses the middle. The internet is distribution. Nothing else is distribution. And I think we're going through innovation that will bring twist people. And I think what I just said about the NBA is scary close. Who do you, what sport do you think is the first to crack that? The NBA. They're the most top heavy. Yeah. And they're homies. This isn't the era of Bird and Magic and Jordan and Ewing. These guys, I mean, Carmelo, Chris Paul, Dwayne Wade, and LeBron might be drinking wine together right now as we sit. These guys, they don't appease me as the fan. I need them to hate each other. I hate the way they fucking do this, but I love it for them. I hate it for me, the fan, right? When I lose a Jets game, I want to punch people in the face. But like for them as humans, I love it. And I love the leverage. And I think it's scarier than people think and closer than people think. So I, you, you hit on this a little bit before, but if you had to pick a sport, and I'm including esports in this, obviously, what would you pick to take over the vast majority of the market share for the, over the next 10 years? Is it soccer? Is it esports? Are you asking which sport net net I'm betting on the most? Correct. From a financial standpoint, like a business standpoint? Yes. Esports. It's in perpetuity scalable. And it's clearly already won. Yeah. Right? So it's it's not limited to physical location. Right? What's better, Amazon or Walmart? Amazon. Now, if Walmart does a great job on walmart.com, right? But like the internet wins. Um, and so esports and the Malt is fascinated by esports and is watching Twitch and is in consideration and it's on the radar. We, Vayner Sports represents a kid by the name of Booga who won the Fortnite championship. He's one of the best esports players in the world. He's more famous to the average 14 year old than a stunning percentage of professional athletes today. Do you by think- By the way, by the way um, somebody said, hey Gary, didn't Kyrie try to do that before the bubble? Yeah, that's an early indication to how close this is. Michael Jordan, it didn't cross Michael Jordan's mind, but Kyrie's flirting. So think about that. Play out the chess moves another 20 years. Yeah. Do you think there's a world where one of the other major sports makes a play to create a hybrid of an eSport? Like you've seen MLS teams bring on eMLS players, right? You've seen the same thing with the NBA, you've seen it around, but is there a way that that really can be married or is it one or the other? Um, no, I think, look, I think anybody has permission to do anything, right? Like I think if MLB or singularly the Minnesota Twins or I think when, I, I think life's about execution, right? Good call out by Latham on NASCAR, right? They've done some nice executions and they have a different model. I think, I think wrestling, you know, WWE can own its infrastructure in a different way given the dictatorship that that framework is in. You know, there's, you know, there's, there's some things out there. I, I, it's just execution. If you're an owner of a sports, you know, uh, I'm wearing a version one esports team. This, I, I, I'm the minority owner of the Minnesota version one team, Rocker in Call of Duty version one, in, um, in Rocket League version one is gonna be the holding co and the brand we build. You know, that's, that's the Wilfs, the owners of, you know, the Vikings, they're my partners. And if we do a good job executing here, nothing stopped them from being good at it, right? Meanwhile, I don't know if Bob Kraft's thrilled with his investment in his world because it hasn't gone as well. You know, it just depends. It's all execution. So I know we're we're almost running out on time here. So I want to sort of try to wrap it up with a question on what we've talked about the trends for the future. We've talked about more career workplace things. If there's one thing you could leave the vast majority of the sports and live entertainment business that are people on this call are here today. 
with advice for the future, what would you tell them? Anything short of disproportionate obsession with bringing the other person value is a vulnerability. The consumer has the leverage. The options are infinite. And there's no place for audacity or entitlement or history or how you think it should be. This is a game of listening and understanding what to bring people in value. And uh, I think that's the game. Awesome. Well, I wanna thank you, Gary, for, for an awesome hour. I wanna thank Ari for getting this all together. I wanna thank everyone for joining. We're going to be sending out a recap a recording of this video um, over the next week or so. Uh, and I wanna have a, everybody have a happy holiday season and thank you, Gary, again so much. Uh, thank you, uh, Ari, FIGO team. Uh, thanks all of you. I appreciate all the comments I'm seeing. Um, I really just, I wish everybody super well. I shared some of my information throughout here. Uh, have a great, great, great holiday season and New Year's. Cheers. YouTube watcher, what's up? It's Gary V. First of all, thank you so much. I hope you're doing super well during these times. Uh, I also wanna ask you, please subscribe because my commitment and exploration of YouTube is about to explode. Stories, polls, more content, more engagement, more surprise and delight. This is the time to subscribe. I hope you consider it and I hope I see you soon.